When it comes to caring for the planet, there are limits to what we can accomplish as individuals. But when we all work together towards a common goal, then we can do a lot to protect the environment. And that is why we are here today. So welcome to this edition of Eco Africa. I am Sandra Twinovidio. Hi there, Sandra. Good to see you again. And you are absolutely right. On today's show, we'll talk a lot about community engagement whether in Africa or Europe, in the city or in the countryside. So let's see what's coming up on this engaging edition of Echo Africa. We'll see how school kids in Senegal learn practical lessons in ecology. Discover how greenhouses are helping ensure food security in the Somalian capital, Mogadishu. And we'll show how an initiative in Cameroon is developing recycling techniques for e-waste. Today's show gets underway on Lamu, a small island right off the coast of Kenya. Lamu's historical old town is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and cars are banned on the island. Yet, Lamu is no ecological paradise. It struggles with environmental issues like omnipresent plastic waste, which harms its sensitive ecosystem in different ways. But now, island residents are coming together and working on a concept to tackle the problem. <music> Life unfolds at a relaxed pace on the Kenyan island of Lamu. Free of cars, sailboats and donkeys are used to transport people and things. Along with tourism, fishing is a major source of income for the island's 25,000 residents. Lamu County also has the most extensive mangrove forest in all of Kenya. More than 30,000 hectares hug the coast, providing an important sanctuary for fish and other creatures. But the delicate ecosystem is being ruined by plastic trash, which has a devastating effect on the mangrove forests. The plastic that is washing into our mangroves also uh, in very large amounts, and it, it forms like a layer. So it means even when the mangrove seedlings want to replant, they don't hit the ground, so they're not able to replant. Lynette Alo has declared war on the plastic waste that plagues not only the mangroves, but the island's beaches as well. There are also several illegal dump sites in the middle of the island. Every other time we visit this dump site, there's always a fire going. So I think it just needs to stop with the talking and we see more of the action that needs to be put in place so that such things are not happening. Animals eat it, like donkeys, cows. They eat the plastics. The other day we went to the slaughterhouse and one cow had over 30 kg of plastic in its, in its stomach. <coughs> Lynette Alo is community coordinator for the Flip Floppy Project, a movement founded in 2015 that aims to bring plastic waste in East Africa into a circular economy to recycle and create something new from it. The plastic problem, it's a problem that is universal, it's worldwide, it's not only associated to Lamu, but now with island communities, uh, it becomes much more predominant. For us, what is exciting is being able to give this plastic a new life. The key to its success is the islanders themselves. They collect the garbage and Flip Floppy pays them money for every kilo they deliver. This has created new income opportunities on the island. I collect this plastic from illegal dump sites, or from shops and neighbours, or from the streets. The money I earn depends on the size of the load. If it's big, I can even get as much as 75 euros. If you can bring it by boat, if you can bring it through the tractor, if you can bring it by just carrying it on your back, if you're able to bring it via tuk-tuk, we accept all means. For us, uh, what is important is that it reaches us here. The plastic is brought to the factory where it gets shredded, washed and dried. Afterwards, it's put into an extrusion machine where it's formed into parts for chairs and window frames or boat frames and planks for fishermen and other inhabitants of Lamu.
mostly we rely on goods being brought in from the mainland and they all come in by boat. One of the things that we're doing with the timber here, the recycled timber that we are making is by making boats through the Heritage Boat Building School. The Boat Building School in Lamu builds doors at the traditional boats of the island. But instead of using wood from the mangroves, they use recycled plastics. And that isn't the only unique aspect. Women work here as well. It's not compulsory that this thing is written for men or is it specific for, for men to do it. We can, we can encourage ourselves as women to, to work and uh, learn about boats. The first traditional doors made of recycled plastics are already sailing off the coast. It's with pride that we can say that uh, we've produced uh, a circular economy around here where there is money with the community, there's products that are being produced, there are people who are getting employment and getting paid, the suppliers are able to better manage their families. As positive as that sounds, if plastic waste never showed up on Lamu in the first place though, that would be even better. It's great to see how the initiatives on Lamu all work hand in hand. Community engagement is key to saving the planet. Yes indeed, Sandra. As we'll see in our next report, about two years ago, a law banning some plastic products was passed in Senegal. But due to the pandemic, the rules weren't really enforced, leaving many streets and parks strewn with trash. Now one school has decided to free up space for greenery. Here is this week's Doing Your Bit. Saddened by the sight of their neglected schoolyard, students at this school in Chess, a small city near Senegal's capital, Dakar, took it upon themselves to spruce up the place. We're becoming much more aware of our environment and how important it is. The environment is our life, and this helps us to learn to respect it everywhere, whether on the street or at home. With the help of their teacher, Kasim Nam, the school children have created an organic garden on the school grounds. Alongside several varieties of mint, they've also planted lemon, mango, and papaya trees. The fruits are sold to their parents and teachers. All proceeds are put into the class fund, and they've even gone beyond the school premises. Over the holidays, we also did some planting in the Ersant neighborhood. We reached out to hospital wards and elementary schools. And now other institutions in Ersant are also interested. So far, the young environmentalists have planted around 40 trees, and they hope their actions will inspire others to do the same. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. From school gardens in Senegal to urban gardening in Germany's capital, many people in Berlin appreciate being able to grow and harvest their own vegetables within the city and share their passion for plants with others too. Yes, Chris, it is also a very effective way to spread knowledge and not just for the adults, just as we saw in the report from Senegal. Children can actively learn about nature as part of environmental studies in schools, even in the winter. How is the school vegetable patch doing after last night's snowfall? Cora, Hira, Max and Johannes want to find out. Just a few weeks ago, their class sowed a small crop of rye here. Now there are already a few shoots coming out. The last time we were here, we couldn't see anything. We only just sowed the seeds. This gardening school flanks Berlin City Highway. The plot spans around 10,000 square meters in size, 
and give school children the chance to discover their green thumbs. There are plenty of trees, a small vineyard, ponds, and lots of things to explore all year round. Berlin's gardening schools are green educational spaces in the city. Some of them have been around for a hundred years. The children can discover nature here and learn about the environment. But it's not just children, adults can visit too. Anyone who's interested in finding out about conservation, the environment, or just experiencing nature can come along. Today's lesson is about conifers. The children's school is very close by. They visit every month to learn about a wide variety of topics. The gardening school is financed by the city. Though it's not open to the general public, anyone can attend its educational events. That's in contrast to this project in the city's east. It's called an intercultural community garden. We visited a few months ago at harvest time. There are community beds that anyone can tend to and individual 40 square meter plots that cost 15 euros a month. Chemical fertilizers and pesticides are taboo here. Tim Kegler is in charge, but he's no gardener. He's a social worker. Intercultural gardens have a distinct concept. They're open to everyone and they're rooted in the neighborhood. They also boost cross-cultural exchange. We cooperate closely with neighborhood institutions like refugee accommodations, the preschool next door, or the elementary school across the road. There used to be two kindergartens on the site. After they were demolished, local residents fought to keep the space free for urban gardening. Today, the work is financed mainly with public funds. There are several dozen community gardens in the city many with an intercultural focus that serves neighborhoods in ways that go well beyond gardening. Deepthi Akarath and her husband Vipin Madhavanuni opted for a more pragmatic garden concept. The two software engineers from India have rented a garden on the outskirts of the city just a few minutes by bike from their home. From April to November, they can be found harvesting their vegetable patch. We started it during the COVID time because we couldn't do anything else and we were working from home. So this was a nice way to go out of the house and do something because we couldn't do anything else, we couldn't travel. So, and this year we also continue the same. The owner rents out gardens in and near large cities at almost 30 locations around Germany. Farmers till the field in spring, then the transverse strips are rented out. Tenants pay around 260 euros per season for 45 square meters. We did a cost-wise analysis also basically last year. We took all, what are things we got, everything, and we put it in Excel and calculated the price. And we found actually this is profitable. For the children in the gardening school, harvesting season is still months away. But thanks to the winter topic conifers, they're now experts in evergreens. And their regular visits to the garden are sure to cultivate a knowledge and appreciation of nature that they can draw on long after they leave school. Returning now to the Horn of Africa, for many people in Somalia, it's not easy to buy or grow food at all. For years, the country has suffered from extreme drought and the rainy season has now failed to materialize three years in a row. It has affected a quarter of the population and prompted more than half a million people to abandon their homes. That's right, Sandra, and many abandoning the country for the city, just like in many other places in the global south over the last 60 years, the percentage of the population living in cities has doubled and climate change has had a big part to play in that. But how can we feed all the people in urban centers? An example from Somalia shows one solution for African cities. This, believe it or not, is a riverbed. 
now dried up and full of garbage. The Shabale River was once a key lifeline in Somalia. Its water supplied the agricultural areas near the capital. Grains, fruits and vegetables for Mogadishu came from this region. But climate change has pitched the country on the Horn of Africa into drought. The UN says it's the region's worst drought in 40 years. Farmer Sido Adan's entire livelihood is at stake. In the last three seasons, the drought has hit our farms badly. We had no crops at all. And the river dried up four months ago. There was no maize on the farm to feed our family. The devastating drought has already forced around 700,000 people from their homes. The capital Mogadishu has therefore already doubled in size. Especially in hot countries, global warming is driving people from the countryside to the city. In Somalia, however, many end up in refugee camps like Hamdi Hussein and her children. I fled my farming village after the drought hit the last three seasons and we couldn't farm any crops. We had to leave because we didn't have any food for the children. Food prices are rising, also driven by Russia's war in Ukraine. That's making aid more expensive too. Even food destined for Somalia doesn't always arrive. There's a number of donors at the beginning, they already told us that some commodities are coming heading towards us. Those commodities were already diverted in the, in the sea, uh, heading to uh, Ukraine. So what can be done? These greenhouses on the edge of Mogadishu may be part of the solution, often financed with farmers' last savings or loans. Awe Abdi now grows tomatoes with groundwater. He needs much less water than before, thanks to drip irrigation and because there's less evaporation in a greenhouse. It was a risk that paid off. In the last three years, there was no rain on our farms and the river was completely dry. So I decided to move to greenhouses to plant our crops, although it was difficult at first to adapt to the greenhouse technology. Abdirahman Sabriyi, in contrast, embodies a new, young type of farmer in Somalia. For him, greenhouses are not an emergency solution. He studied greenhouse farming at the Somali National University. His family then helped him get started with seed capital of $10,000. He says greenhouse farming produces more vegetables and more reliably. The great thing about greenhouses is that you can harvest all year round and you don't have to worry about the dry river or an absence of rain. As long as you have a small amount of water, you can plant any crops in it. They harvest here twice a week, picking a total of around 400 kilos of tomatoes, and they've taken on six employees. At the Hamar Weine market in Mogadishu, the traders have a lot less fresh produce to offer because of the drought. Some of the gaps can be filled with greenhouse produce. These fruits and vegetables are often more fresh. We expect the rain to start again soon, but the river is still dry. There's no water in it at all. We get some fruits and vegetables from greenhouse farmers who sell to us at a very high prices, but we have no other way of getting fruits and vegetables. Greenhouses can't solve Somalia's food crisis, but they are an important addition. That's according to agriculture expert Abdul Qadir Shirwa. Food security. Greenhouses can contribute to food security in Somalia when the production of conventional farms is very low in the country, like it is at this time. The greenhouses produce a huge amount of fruits and vegetables, which can fill the gap in the market. They also contribute to Somalia's economy as well. 
About 50 farmers near Mogadishu are now growing vegetables in greenhouses. It's the best alternative, as long as the Shabele River remains a dry wasteland. Our last report deals with an enduring problem, e-waste. More than 50 million metric tons are generated globally every year. Less than 2% of Africa's e-waste is disposed of professionally. Old computer screens and cell phones are difficult to recycle, mainly due to the many toxic materials they contain. But there are ways of getting around that problem. Here is one example from Cameroon. The pickup crew is out on its daily rounds. These employees from the NGO Solidarité Technologique are collecting electronic waste in Cameroon's capital, Yaoundé. And today, they're in luck. This family has some items for them. A telephone, a computer monitor, and some other scrap. The NGO aims to dispose of e-waste in an environmentally sound fashion, as required by law passed here in Cameroon in 2012. Solidarité Technologique is among the first organizations or companies working to implement it. When a CRT picture tube, for example, is disassembled by someone who isn't trained to do it, the mercury, the lead, it all escapes into the air. And when they break it up, that person breathes it all in and it affects the body. The people standing nearby also breathe it in, so they are also affected. Then there's the ozone layer. Everything that is burned affects the ozone layer. Another country suffering the hazardous effects of e-waste is Ghana. Since the early 2000s, tons of electronics from around the world have been dumped in a suburb of Accra. The environmental impact has been disastrous, and yet, Despite legislation calling for sound disposal, nothing has changed, says Martin Otenababio of the University of Ghana, who does research on urban environmental management. We've had a law passed, and that is commendable. But in terms of the challenge itself, I can even say that it's getting worse. Worse to the extent that the areas where that are being polluted have have, have spread across the city space. First, it was concentrated in Agubloshi. Today, every neighborhood you, 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 you visit within the peri-urban Accra, you see one way or the other people doing electronic waste. Worldwide, the amount of e-waste is growing. In 2022, it was estimated to be around 50 million tons. By 2030, it will likely exceed 75 million tons. Africa in particular needs solutions to get the growing mountains of e-waste under control, even though its share of the global total is relatively low, about 3 million tons. But that figure is rising rapidly as the expanding African middle class buys more and more electronics. It happens that more waste are even being generated internally than coming from our side. And that makes the need for eco-friendly recycling of televisions, computers, and cell phones even more crucial. To support proper disposal, Solidarité Technologique now does pickups in Cameroon's two largest cities, Douala and Yaoundé. The NGO collects about 130 tons per year. It can already recycle many devices, but for some components, few options exist. Some recycling techniques are only in operation abroad at the moment, particularly in Europe. We are working with partner companies to dispose of waste like electronic cards and circuit boards, which is not yet technically possible in Cameroon. Partnerships like those are helpful for now. But the goal is to set up modern recycling systems right here in Africa. That would be a major benefit for the local economies and the environment. It's always inspiring to hear about the methods people develop to tackle environmental problems. 
and we love sharing these solutions with you here on Eco Africa. But well, we've run out of time for today. It's goodbye from me, Chris Alems, in Ogun State, Nigeria. It is also time to bid you farewell, but you can always check out our social media channels and comment on what you've seen. There, you also find all the latest information on environmental issues on DW's internet site. From me, Sandra Twinobio, it is a goodbye from Kampala here in Uganda. <music>